During the 1870s, Onondaga Lake looked very different from what we see when we look at it today. The Oswego Canal ran along the entire eastern shoreline of the lake, and 62 large salt boiling blocks were located along the banks of the canal near the village of Liverpool. By 1887, Thomas Gale had constructed extensive solar salt works along the plank road that ran between the village of Liverpool and the city of Syracuse. That plank road is now Old Liverpool Road. During that time, the western side of Onondaga Lake was mostly undeveloped land. Fred Gaynor of Liverpool was the first person to realize the potential of that land. He decided that the lakeside would be an ideal setting for a pleasant day trip. Destinations that were close at hand were a necessity because people were still using horse-drawn carriages for transportation. Mr. Gaynor opened a picnic grove at Lakeview Point and soon added a hotel. Lakeview proved to be a financial success and provided the incentive for the further development of the western side of the lake. Even larger and more lavish amusement parks were quickly built, and each new resort strived to outdo the older ones. During the gay 90s, eight large amusement parks and several smaller resorts were developed. Names like Rockaway Beach, Maple Bay, and White City became synonymous with fine beaches, exciting rides and amusements, and good food and drink. This development would later result in the area being referred to as the Coney Island of Central New York. By 1890, visitors to many of the larger resorts would have arrived by steamboat from the Iron Pier. All of the resorts had built long piers that jutted out into the lake, and the fare for a round-trip boat ride was 25 cents. It must have been a pleasant experience to ride on one of those boats as it gently steamed around the lake. Chartered boats also departed for the resorts from the Erie Canal Packet Dock located in Clinton Square. They would have gone up the Oswego Canal, passed through Mud Lock, out into the Seneca River, and from there into Onondaga Lake. Once in the lake, the boats could have docked at any one of the resort piers. Interurban trolley improvements in 1898 made accessibility to the resorts even easier. A lakeshore trolley route was established from Clinton Square to each one of the resort locations, giving the general population a quick and cheap means of mass transportation. Women carrying parasols and wearing full-length dresses and large hats. Men wearing double-breasted suits with black bowlers or straw hats. And children in their Sunday best would travel to their chosen location by horse-drawn carriage, boat, or by trolley car. Arriving early in the day, they would spend the entire day enjoying the many attractions offered by the resort. The lake experienced its golden age during the years from 1875 to 1920. Imagine a sparkling clear lake with seven hotels, six restaurants, six large dance pavilions, four roller coasters, two carousels, two roller skating rinks, bowling alleys, and a multitude of other attractions located along the shoreline. Let's take a closer look at some of the locations that played an important role in Onondaga Lake's history. We begin with Mud Lock and the tavern that was once located next to the lock. Officially known as Lock Number 5, Mud Lock was part of the Oswego Canal system that opened in 1828. Built in unstable soil, which led to its nickname Mud Lock was originally constructed out of wood. By 1836, the original wooden lock had been replaced by a larger stone one. The lock was enlarged again in 1862 and 1887 to allow for the passage of larger boats. 
The tavern located next to the lock was infamous for brawls between rival canal boat crews during the 1840s. In later years, Mudlock Tavern became a popular rest stop for many of the boats carrying passengers to the lake resorts. The Oswego Canal system was abandoned in 1918, but Mudlock was restored in 1933 as an historic site. The tavern that had been located next to the lock was torn down at that time. And this is what Mudlock looks like today. of the true resorts to be developed. Situated on the point of land located at the mouth of Nine Mile Creek, Lakeview provided a spectacular vantage point from which you could see the entire lake or the rolling hills to the south of Syracuse. The point had always been a popular spot for picnics, so when Fred Gaynor began development of that area in 1872, he started with a simple picnic grove. He quickly added a large hotel, and Lakeview became the place to go. Churches, clubs, societies all held their annual outings at Lakeview, with local musical groups providing entertainment. Large group picnics of three to 5,000 people were not uncommon. Frank Haverly bought Lakeview in 1899. He intended to turn it into a private family resort as the Syracuse, Lakeside, and Baldwinsville trolley line had just been completed. The trolley line connected the resort to downtown Syracuse and Baldwinsville, but there were some problems. The biggest problem was that the resort was located next to the Salve Process Company. Salve Process was one of the major sources of the lake's growing pollution problem. The company had been granted permission to mix its waste lime products with city sewage and deposit it along the shoreline just south of Lakeview Point. This practice led to the pollution of the waters near the point. Another problem was that Lakeview had never been able to match the level of entertainment offered by the newer resorts. These facts, combined with the death of its owner in 1915, brought about the closing of Lakeview after just 43 years. Salve Process sludge beds now cover that site. was the second successful resort to open and one of the last to close. Located just to the north of Lakeview Point, Pleasant Beach was also one of the largest resorts built on the lake. First established in 1874 as a picnic area known as Cohen's Grove, it was reputed to have had the best swimming and bathing area on the lake. In 1899, a direct trolley line was established to the bathing beach, which featured a sandy bottom perfect for wading. Pleasant Beach was also noted for special events. The exotic dancer, Little Egypt, made her only Central New York appearance there, much to the concern of local ministers. Hot air balloon ascensions, death-defying parachute jumps, high dives by daredevils, fox hunts on the grounds, and grand military and marine reenactments were all just a few of the special attractions that drew large crowds to Pleasant Beach. During the 80 years of its existence, three different hotels were built at Pleasant Beach. The first hotel was the Lackawanna. 
It featured wide porches on all three levels and a restaurant famous for frog leg dinners. When the Lackawanna burned to the ground, a new hotel was quickly built on the same site. That building was later torn down when the level of the lake was raised, flooding the site. The third and last hotel, a massive wooden structure, was built in 1912. It remained in continuous operation until 1954, making Pleasant Beach the last of the lake resorts to close. In a fitting farewell ceremony, there was a large party held at the hotel just before it was torn down to clear the way for the construction of Route 690. Newspaper accounts of the party stated that Bob Johnson's Pleasant Beach Hotel closed with a bang early this morning. Everything was on the house and 400 friends gathered to aid in a fitting closing out party. built by the Rapid Transit Railroad in 1888 is our next stop. Located approximately where Carousel Mall now stands, the Iron Pier was a terminal for packet boats, horse cars, and later electric cars. Most of the visitors to the Iron Pier arrived from the center of Syracuse on streetcars for a five-cent fare. Constructed out of wood, not iron, the Iron Pier was 600 feet long by 50 feet wide. Land, harbor, and buildings cost $108,000. It was advertised as, quote, the best and only first class day and evening pleasure resort in central New York. It boasted that more than $100,000 had been invested in specialties for the entertainment of visitors. By 1890, the Iron Pier was also known as the gateway to Onondaga Lake. Steamboats would leave from the public dock every half hour and travel the length of the lake, docking at all the resort piers located along the lake's western shore. The Iron Pier featured brilliantly lighted grounds, Electric lights were still a novelty to most people. Band concerts every day and evening. A large dance hall, 90 by 50 feet. A large restaurant. Boat rentals. You could rent anything from a small canoe to a large steam yacht at the Iron Pier. A spacious playground on the beach and a toboggan water slide. After just 19 years as a major lakeside attraction, the Iron Pier closed its doors in 1907. The next major attraction to claim a lakeside setting was the New York State Fair. In 1889, the city of Syracuse designated a parcel of land located along the western shore of the lake as the permanent home of the New York State Fair. The fair, along with its agricultural exhibits, always offered rides and other amusements. Today, the fair is still an annual event that draws almost one million people to the lake shore every fall. Long Branch Park was the next resort to open. Barnhart 
Mauer, and his brother George purchased land along the outlet of the lake for a resort in 1882. By 1890, Ben had bought out his brother's shares and opened the area to the public. The first year, there was only one ride, a small merry-go-round, but every year more attractions were added. By the turn of the century, it was one of Onondaga Lake's most popular amusement parks and boasted that it offered something for everyone. It was probably one of the best family amusement parks of its time. Named for the large chestnut and tulip trees that were on the site, Long Branch became the favorite location for Sunday school picnics and family outings. Drunken or disorderly behavior was not tolerated, and rowdies were tossed into one of the two jail cells located in the park until their manners improved. Special events drew large crowds to Long Branch Park. Day Brothers Department Store held its annual picnic there, and the weekly Kitty's Day always attracted a large crowd. But the most famous annual event was the Farmer's Picnic held on Labor Day. Hundreds of farm families from the surrounding areas came to Long Branch Park on that day. During its earliest days, boats chartered by Mr. Mauer brought customers to Long Branch from the Iron Pier, located at the foot of the lake. Smaller canal boats also departed for the resort via the Oswego Canal. This photograph shows a packet boat in the Oswego Canal. It is leaving for Long Branch Park from the Crawford Dock, once located at the foot of Sycamore Street in Liverpool. The photo caption reads, Sunday School Picnic Outing, circa 1900. After 1899, Long Branch could be reached by trolley car. A branch of the Syracuse Lakeshore and Baldwinsville trolley line ended in a loop at the entrance to the park. A tornado struck the northern part of Onondaga County and Long Branch Park at 5 p.m. on September 15, 1912. The park suffered extensive damage. Most of the large trees that had shaded the site were broken off or uprooted. Buildings were blown down. Trolley cars were overturned, and the roller coaster and all of the other rides were either severely damaged or completely destroyed. After an assessment of the damages, Mr. Maurer immediately began rebuilding, and Long Branch came back better than ever. In 1925, after another extensive restoration, the gates of the newly renovated Long Branch Park proudly stated that this was the new Long Branch Park. Let all who enter here leave care behind. Improvements included a bigger wooden roller coaster that had a sheer drop of 98 feet and could reach speeds of 90 miles an hour. A new modern carousel with jumper horses that moved up and down was installed in the upper level of the park in 1926. But even that attraction was not enough to bring in needed customers. Long Branch kept losing business to other newer and more distant attractions and finally closed its doors in 1938. In 1941, after three years of disuse, that new carousel was sold to the owners of Roseland Park in Canandaigua, New York. In 1985, Roseland Park went out of business and the carousel was sold again. This time, it went to the pyramid companies for $397,500. The Pyramid Company spent the next two years restoring the carousel to its original beauty, and now it is the centerpiece of the Carousel Center Shopping Mall. Carousel Mall is the modern-day equivalent of one of the gay 90s Lakeshore resorts. It attracts thousands of visitors every week, and many of them take a ride on the restored carousel that was once part of Long Branch Park. Long Branch Park was in operation for almost 50 years, and over the years it offered 
a covered picnic area with seating for 100 to 150 people, a dance hall where a Wurlitzer organ played during the day and a live orchestra played every night, a large roller coaster, a modern carousel, a well-maintained midway with rides like circle swings, the whip, and a Russian toboggan, a goldfish pond, bowling alleys and billiard rooms, a shooting gallery, baseball games. Long Branch sponsored its own team and maintained a baseball field, a restaurant and a fish fry, a soda fountain and a beer garden, a popcorn stand, silent movies, a boat livery, a motor launch for rides in the river, a playground, dramatic firework displays, and a jail with two cells. Maple Bay is the next resort on our tour. It was established in 1890 at the large curve in the lake's northern shore, west of the lake's outlet and south of Long Branch Park. Maple Bay's name came from the lofty maple trees that encircled the area and provided a shaded setting for the amusement park. Willis Barnum first built a large hotel on the site and then began adding rides and other amusements. In 1896, some Philadelphia capitalists got together and decided to buy and enlarge Maple Bay. Their plans included building an immense shoot the chute, a monster carousel, and elegant polo and lawn tennis courts. During the next three years, they greatly enlarged Maple Bay and renamed it Lakeside Park. In 1905, Lakeside Park claimed that it was the king of all summer resorts. They boasted that they had the largest midway and that their dance pavilion was the largest in the state, with the exception of Coney Island. Lakeside also advertised that they had the largest pier on the lake, a major hotel, a large shady grove for the comfort of picnic parties, bowling alleys, polo and lawn tennis courts, a roller skating rink, a huge amusement park complete with a roller coaster, a miniature train ride, and a Nickelodeon, a half mile cycle track, a shallow bathing beach, an open air theater seating 2,500, a prize fight arena, and a small zoo with animal rides for children. During its final years, Lakeside Park lost a lot of its charm. Fights between rival gangs occurred there almost every weekend. As its reputation for being a rough place spread, families avoided the park and business began to fall off. Gradually, everything passed into decay. <laughs> to Rockaway Beach. Located to the south of Maple Bay, it was built in 1895 by Civil War veteran Joseph Hecker. It was a resort that catered to sportsmen. Rockaway Beach didn't have midway rides and didn't care to attract children. The atmosphere was geared to an adult crowd and featured boating, shooting, bowling, dancing, and picnicking. The resort was popular for its banquets, clam bakes, and 25-cent wild duck dinners. Mr. Hacker or one of his sons would shoot the ducks, and the dinners came complete with soup, potato, a vegetable, and possibly some birdshot. 
Rockaway Beach was an ideal place to hunt, fish, or sail. In winter, it was the home of the Onondaga Ice Yacht Club, and every Sunday afternoon, weather permitting, there were ice boat races. On Christmas Eve, 1901, more than 1,500 people gathered to watch a race that was won by John Hecker's boat, Rockaway. Rockaway Beach was also an excellent place to ice skate. The lake would freeze before Christmas and provide three to four months of good skating weather. Large skating parties were often held at Rockaway Beach. The hotel at Rockaway was later divided up into apartments and the building remained standing until 1954 when it was leveled to make way for the construction of Route 690. All that now remains of Rockaway Beach are the two fallen cement pillars on the western shore of the lake. The original Yacht Club is our next stop. It was built on the southwestern shore of Onondaga Lake below Lakeview Point near the present State Fairgrounds. Organized in 1896 by Lyman C. Smith, the typewriter king, the elaborate clubhouse opened its doors in 1899. The Yacht Club offered major docking facilities for all types of boats to both the general public and its members. 150 motor launches and almost as many sailboats once docked at the Yacht Club. The Yacht Club was a massive wooden structure suspended over the water on log pilings driven into the lake's bottom. It cost $30,000 to build and during its peak years had a membership of 2,000. Many of the prominent Syracusans of the time were listed on the Yacht Club's membership rolls. Daily luncheons and elegant dinners were part of the routine, and to be seen dining at the club was a major social coup. Rowing regattas were very popular during the gay 90s. Results of the crew races between Harvard and Yale were reported on the front pages of the New York Times. The Yacht Club was headquarters for the crews from Syracuse University, and they often celebrated holidays by hosting big rowing events. The Syracuse University team's reputation greatly profited from all this racing activity. On May 10, 1917, tragedy struck, and the Yacht Club burned to the waterline. You can see the remains of the old wooden pilings in this photograph. The club was never rebuilt on that site, but years later, a smaller yacht club was established on the eastern shore of the lake near Liverpool's marina. a trolley company as a destination, White City was the last and possibly the most spectacular resort to grace the shores of Onondaga Lake. Built on the 12-acre site that is now a parking lot for the state fair, the trolley company hoped to make money from both trolley fares and admission charges. Constructed in 1906, a quarter of a million dollars was spent on this copy of Coney Island. Everything was painted a sparkling white, and more than 25,000 electric light bulbs illuminated the site. It was reported that it presented a breathtaking sight at night. 
The resort included a large platform open to the sky that had room to seat 5,000 people for band concerts and vaudeville performances. It also had a small lagoon, a 15,000 square foot ballroom, a restaurant overlooking the lagoon that could seat 1,000 people, a Japanese tea garden, a miniature scenic railroad, a children's playground, and many other attractions such as the Old Mill and the Johnstown Flood. The miniature scenic railroad featured a ride through tunnels painted with a panorama of picturesque scenes. Appropriate sounds were piped in to enhance the experience. But the most famous ride of all was the breathtaking Shoot the Chutes. Patrons rode a dugout boat straight down a long chute to splash into the man-made lagoon at the bottom. On opening day, May 30th, 1906, 41,000 people came to White City. But after being in operation for only nine years, it closed and was quickly abandoned in 1915. Many of the other area resorts were also dying out at that time. After World War I, all of the resorts began to decline in popularity. The increasing availability of automobiles provided a growing mobility for people that led them to look further afield for their amusements. Ever-increasing pollution of the lake was also a contributing factor. By the late 1920s, Onondaga Lake was at the end of an age. The Oswego Canal had been abandoned in 1918. The salt industry was completely gone by 1926, and most of the major resorts had closed their doors. Nothing was left but skeletal remains in an area that once teemed with industrial and recreational activity. Ironically, it was the Great Depression of 1929 that sparked a rebirth and renewed interest in the lakeshore. New York State set up the Emergency Relief Act, and Liverpool banker Crandall Melvin was selected to direct the local program. Thousands of people were put to work, and many improvements were made along the eastern shoreline of the lake. Some of the projects undertaken during the 1930s included the building of Onondaga Lake Parkway, the old French fort, the Salt Museum, Griffin Field, Jesuit Well, Gale Salt Spring, the Onondaga Lake Marina, and the restoration of Mud Lock. The old Oswego Canal bed and surrounding marshland were filled in to create Onondaga Lake Park. Today, this area has become a very popular recreational site. The paved trails built on top of the old Oswego Canal bed are used for biking, walking, running, rollerblading, and tram rides. The marina was built in 1935 to provide a public boat launch and docking facilities for all types of boats. In 1939, a seaplane base was added to the marina, and on October 11, 1940, Eleanor Roosevelt's seaplane landed here. The marina and yacht club are still in use today, but it has been many years since seaplanes routinely landed on Onondaga Lake. The parkway that extends along the lake below the village of Liverpool was created when the lake was dredged to fill in the old Oswego Canal. Today it is often closed on Sundays during the summer to provide an additional area for biking, running, and rollerblading. During the week it is a heavily traveled commuter route to and from Syracuse. In 1952, Onondaga Lake became the site of the Intercollegiate Spring Rowing Regatta. The crew races were held here yearly until the mid-1990s. The Syracuse University crew still practices on the lake or in the Seneca River. Today, only scant reminders remain from the many resorts that once flourished on Onondaga Lake. 
spring flooding and changes in the shoreline have taken their toll. In one place you can find the remnants of the concrete pillars and pier that were part of Rockaway Beach. The pillars have fallen and the pier is underwater, but when the lake is low, you can still see the remnants of the old pier lying just under the surface of the water. Once again, the western shore of Onondaga Lake is undeveloped land with little left to remind one of its once magnificent structures. A paved trail now runs partway down the shoreline that was once home to many large resorts. You can walk or bike there and if you close your eyes and use your imagination, you might be able to picture what it was like more than 100 years ago when that western shoreline was known as the Coney Island of Central New York.